uh, oh, thank you, to come and just share out what's been happening in LWEA 7 around making a recommendation for a referral system. So pretty excited to have that conversation and, and get your feedback on it. And then we'll be looking for people to join the policy writing subgroup. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So um, all names visible on the Zoom will be called and um, Sarah will take over the roll call from here. Okay, perfect. And I just want to make sure there's new people in the room and I apologize ahead of time if I do not get your name correctly, but if I don't, you can chime in and correct me. Um, so I'm just going to read the names on the Zoom participant list. And if you don't hear your name, you can go ahead and unmute and let us know that you're here. So Becky Raymond, Sarah Goldhammer, Marissa Lewis, Kathy Tracy, Drew Thomason, Molly Cook, Nadia Mejie, is that right? Nadia Mejia. Okay. Okay. Stacy Craggle, Emma Malahut Butel. I'm so sorry. This is it's okay. It's so okay. Um, Maya Butel. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Justin Arnold, Tara Driver, Courtney Greiger, Janice Taylor Brown, Megan McGinty, Todd Lowry, Brian Richard, Laura Dom, Natasha Telger. I'm just going to make sure that that's everyone. And again, if you didn't hear your name mentioned, you can go ahead and unmute and we'll make sure that you're accounted for on the minutes. Good. Okay. Um, just to revisit our community agreements, we are keeping customers central to the discussion. We're taking and making space so that everyone can um, have balanced contributions. We're trying to avoid jargon to the best of our ability. There's no such thing as a silly question. And together, we know a lot just to keep rooted in these as our community agreements. Um, and because people are in so many working groups, what are the priorities of this work group? Um, it's to integrate service delivery, to improve access and opportunity. It's to um, you know, promote cross-agency collaboration and alignment and to review the 2019 self-assessment process. Um, so, you know, just again, to make sure that everyone's on board, that our ultimate goal is to revise the current service integration policy and present it to the IWIB by July, 2023. Um, and so in the November meeting, we reviewed the OneStop Operator Focus Group questions. Um, Carrie shared uh, research that she had been doing on the MOU process and the work group discussed the plan and goals for the scope. Um, and so because the service integration policy is so broad, several of the um, areas will be also coordinated with other work groups um, around staff goals, career path way goals, information and evaluation. And so since we last met in November, um, Sarah and Molly have been looking at the local plans and have started compiling and categorizing some of the content that's relative to service integration. Um, we had three one-stop operator focus groups that I'm excited to share out about. And we're starting to really identify the themes from the one-stop operator um, focus group, which we'll get into now. Oh, wait, one last thing before. And then, so today we're reporting out about the research from the focus groups. We're establishing the policy writing subgroup. And this referral discussion is a new point on our work plan, um, we were asked um, 
by a couple of the partners to present on the work that we've been doing in LWIA 7 and the focus groups also, there are other areas that are also have really interesting things to share, but we're going to start with the work we've been doing in LWIA 7 and, and start the conversation from there. So sound good? Does anybody have any questions? I feel like I'm just rushing through the deck here. Anything? No? Okay. All right. Okay. So, there, we'll take this one. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So during December, Molly Cook and I, my colleague at ICSPS, reviewed 18 local plans, specifically Chapter 4, which entailed the 2022 modifications. And we made sure to pull local plans representing each area of the state. We didn't have time yet to delve into more findings, but our initial findings so far are they do lack consistency in formatting. Um, there are many useful examples within the plans, and they all noted different plan modifications structurally based on COVID-19 impacts. We did also come across a question internally is how can we make this local planning process more useful to the entire system? And that's one that I know this group will end up getting to. The next steps within the local plan research is to continue to pair, compare them to focus group statements, um, to analyze themes and commonalities across the local plans and regions, to highlight promising practices from these local plans and identify noted struggles and barriers. So that's just kind of where we're at in the research. And now we'll kick it back over to Becky for the focus groups. Okay, thank you, um, Sarah. So yeah, we did three focus groups in December. We had 15 participants, seven were in the central part of the state, eight were in the Northern. We also were really thinking through um, what the model was for one-stop operator. Um, 11 were part of a consortium model represented by Title I um, predominantly and one represented by Title III, and the remainder were single entity representatives. So just thinking through how the model of the one-stop operator you know, might have an impact in response to some of these questions that we asked. So I have a I have a, a clarifying question, please. Sure. Um, you had fifteen participants. Am I interpreting this correctly that the participants were either from Title One or Title Three? Unless it was a single entity. So did you have any Title Two or Title Four individuals in in these spaces? Is that who you? Is that who the single entity representatives are? Do, as we're looking at service integration, it's important to have the voices of all the partners at the table, and I see a large grouping of Title One and Title Three, mostly Title One, but I, I guess I'm I'm really not seeing um, Title Two and Title Four with a strong representation in this. So I'm just a little concerned that if we're talking about service integration across the state. Um, that I think all of the titles should be part of it. And I, we talked about that last time, that all titles should be equally represented. And I, I'm, I'm missing this, or I'm not seeing it, but I'm seeing it very heavily um, influenced by Title I. Is, is that kind of the direction we needed to go? Or is that because that's who was available? Or, excuse me. Um, um, we did hear that. from one Title II consortium member, but... Um, I, I think that is part of the issue is that title two or title one, even in the consortium models is like, rep, I don't know. It just, it's, that's who responded to our request to attend. I mean, let's see, Justin, are you, are you responding to Kathy or do you have something? No, that's, um, uh, I'm not responding to something else. I'm responding to Kathy, which is. This is typical of the work that gets done in local workforce areas every day, which is Title I is responsive and at the table 
and it's hard to get other people at the table. So we've asked, like even in our area, and I know other areas did too, Title II, Title III, Title IV, do you want to show up? This is important. A month, two months, hey, this is going on. We're going to have these meetings. Please show up. We want to engage you. And then just don't show up. And, and that happens throughout Illinois is for whatever reason, two, three, and four um, aren't as well, responsive I, as Title I. I, I think I, I would I would respectfully disagree that um, the titles aren't equally as concerned about this workspace. Um, it, there might be because because as I hear from my Title II partners, um, where they often feel excluded from these conversations. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I don't think it's a Title I, Title II issue. I think it's how we communicate with these groups as expectations. Um, and I, because I know they're all doing hard work. So I guess the challenge, and, and I'll let it go here, but I do think that we cannot get to a point of service integration and policy without voices from all partners, without everybody at the table, so that we can deal and address the concerns that Justin is sharing, saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do, and they're, we're, we're not seeing that partnership. Well, then what is the messaging that I have to give to my programs as Title II? What does that messaging look like? How do I support this work to make them um, informed if that is the actual barrier? I guess, and I know we talked about this last time, so I don't want to belabor it, but I don't know how we can look at the outcome of this as anything that's going to lead to service integration when three of the four people, three of the four partners, um, were not actively engaged in this process. So, yeah. So, I mean, I just want to say that, like, we had to cobble together a list. Like, there was not even a list of one stop operators readily available. So, right. then once we've got together a list of who's doing one stop operation and we just pulled it together thinking through who we knew, um, we sent it out. And so, like, yes, I think we could dig deeper and I would love your support in getting Title II. Of, I mean, I'm, I feel very strongly about Title II's role in this. And then the reality of how deep we can work to engage partners beyond an email when it, you know, it took us a while to like mm -hmm. get contact information. So just like, I, I see this focus group process as really building up the ability to even talk to one-stop operators um, comprehensive. So that's also in response to Courtney's question about how were the in individuals invited. So we pulled together the list to the best of our ability. And, and yeah, I would like to see, you know, even more um, engagement. I think like, you know, maybe some of them didn't know us, so they were reluctant or, you know, I think that this stuff is going to build with time, but um, that's kind of what we were starting for from Laura. Um, hi, I just wanted to address that the um, one stop operator policy requires that each of the local areas procure the one stop operator. And so they do put out a request for proposal and those that are consortium models are supposed to provide a um, plan that shows how each of the partners within the consortium model are to, to work towards doing the goals of the one-stop operator. A lot of times they should separate out Title one will do this, title two will do this, title three will do X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. And so then there's also, once they provide that, and there is a contract written with the board and the one-stop operator, if there's not anything in question, or they can even go further and define those roles in the one-stop operator agreement contract. Um, and so perhaps that is a good um, thing that we could look at to say that, you know, maybe this is not um, come to fruition as much as it should be. Maybe these roles and responsibilities are not laid out well enough. Maybe people aren't aware of, of, of what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, so I, I definitely think that there is more than enough room for 
for us to get where we need to be for service integration. I think we just need to have everyone in the room and say, hey, you know, expectations need to be set forth and everyone needs to be aware of those expectations before we can move forward. And that's all I wanted to add. Thanks, Laura. Janice? Hi, Janice. Hi. Um, so I did want to say when these type of invites go out, um, if you wouldn't mind either like immediately after they go out forwarding the same email to this group or whoever wants to receive such emails, um, because I would certainly be on the phone encouraging um, Title III to be on that. Um, and so I think um, as representatives of different titles, we can encourage our locals to show up to these things. Um, and sometimes without that encouragement, it doesn't always happen as we see here. <laughs> so that would be really helpful. And I would certainly um, uh, increase Title III's participation. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so yes, we could have done that more thoroughly. Um, but then moving on just to kind of get to the content um, of the areas that we were looking at, we were looking at customer-centered design, we were looking at intake and assessment, and we were looking at service goals. Wait, Janice, did you have one more thing that you were? No, I just forgot to lower my hand. Okay, sorry, I just <laughs> wanted to make sure. Um, I hey, Becky. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Yeah. Thank no, you, that's Justin. all right. Um, so if we, as a group, as a committee with title one, two, three, eight, four representation are going to end up making suggestions on policy changes to these goals. And we have an expectation that local areas are going to respond positively to them in some way. Um, and we think that, um, what happened here is kind of uh, a demonstration of what often happens in local areas. Then us as a group, we kind of need to keep that in mind. It, this is my opinion. The conversation shouldn't be about there is less representation. The conversation should be about how can you spend three months doing something and people still don't show up? And so we kind of, there's something we need to change as a system where we're paying attention and we're making sure we're showing up and we're giving things priority and not being upset after the fact when, you know, 75% of us decided not to show up. So going forward, if we're serious about having serving customers and intakes and service goals that local areas care about, there has to be some sort of sense of urgency and accountability where three months go by and we don't blame somebody else, but we say, we didn't do this as a local area. We didn't take responsibility for it. And we got to stop that from happening. So from like going forward from now on, if something is, needs uh, action taken, we need to take action instead of not taking action and then complaining that some people didn't show up. And how do we do that? And maybe that's a rhetorical, but I see it all the time as people complain after the fact instead of doing something beforehand. And that is, you know, typical government type stuff. So let's try and not do that and figure out, you know, how to solve the problem before it happens and get everyone to take this seriously, commit to it, be accountable to each other, and not a year from now go, oh, I don't know. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. Um, so the last area is around four goals addressing how the one-stop services are provided. And so those were the three areas that we talked about one-stop operators, talk to one-stop operators about. So Sarah, if you want to just keep going here again, we asked in each goal area, how the, um, how it's working in the local area, what could be done better. And we're still pulling it together um, in terms of the themes, but I will say for the first one around customer-centered design, you know, we did hear 
from the local areas that they're building back their capacity to gather feedback and that they find it challenging to build this back when you know some partners are in person some are not and that that seems to be just like a continuous rub around um getting this this goal we heard a lot from the partners about how they felt um in terms of coordination and communication when things were shutting down through COVID. So um, that's just kind of a snapshot of the um, feedback that we received. And in terms of the next area intake and assessment, um, it's the same thing, but we definitely saw local areas being creative in developing tools. And so we, um, in addition to sharing out what we've been doing in LBS 7 we're going to do some deeper dives into some local areas that really felt like they had some strong tools in place for intake assessment and referrals. And, and then in the last area, um, you know, again, we want to uncover more of the creative solutions that LBS have been um, mentioning in the focus groups and, you know, talking about how, you know, we have really discrete policies around a seven day turnaround in our referral. We add contact information, customer receives a copy. I mean, so we're going to be doing a little bit um, more of a deeper dive with a couple of the areas um, in the next couple of weeks and, and continuing to have conversations there. But overall, we saw some bright spots on the landscape. We also heard a lot of, um, you know, things that Justin has definitely been talking about since I came into this position of leading this uh, work group around trauma and recovery and, you know, feelings um, about how to rebuild after going through um, everything that we've went through with COVID. So um, from there, if there's any feedback or discussion, as I mentioned at the top, we were also asked to present on the work that we've been doing in LWEA 7. And so I don't, I, I kind of want to be sure that we have time for Stacy's presentation about what the One Step Operator team has pulled together. The new, many of the new faces that you're seeing on today's call are um, the One Step Operator team from Scale It that has been on this referral recommendation journey for like a year now and trying to really be sure to do the due diligence and get that engagement from all of the titles and all of the partners. Um, and so I think from here, I will turn it over to Stacy. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the Strategy and Implementation Director at Scale It. We have a lot of the One Stop Operator team on the call today, and we're going to go over some slides um, that we have been sharing with our referral working group. Want to go to the next slide? Yeah, so um, I'll go over a little overview. I'll show you a timeline of what we've been through over the past year. And then we've recently started to collect some survey results from our partners on what platform they would uh, recommend. Go to the next slide. So we take the, a human-centered design approach to our working groups tackling um, a number of different projects. Referrals is one of the things that we're tasked with to try to bring a unified referral process to LWIA 7, which is consists of 10 American job centers. And yeah, we ask volunteers from the centers, um, ideally across all partners and, and all the offices to help us figure out solutions. Um, we wanna hear directly from them. We want it to come from them. That's the human-centered design aspect. We're creating this for you. So whatever um, 
whatever you guys want us to, to help with and whatever would work best for the individuals on the ground. That's what we want to bring to the table. Let me jump to the next slide. So some of the goals of the referral working group specifically um, includes having a, a standardized process across all of the network, improving the customer experience, making sure that we're able to do follow-up and reporting around those referrals, and then double-checking um, you know, that this is a process that works with continuous um, evaluation and improvement. And then of course, the one-stop operator will provide training um, to, to the centers and all the partners to make sure that um, we're all using this correctly. Wanna... Next slide. These are the members that we've had participate over um, a little under a year. They've, these individuals have attended one or more of the working group meetings that we've had. So we have had 46 partners across seven titles and 22 organizations. And I think we've had uh, representation from um, all 10 of the centers in, in Alwea 7. So go with that. Yes. Um, so we started around February, so almost exactly a whole year um, ago today. We were tasked to, again, bring a referral solution. Oh, we've missed Tara on there. Got to make sure we add her. Um, so we have, we've had a number of referral working group meetings where we um, collect feedback and you know what what the partners are looking for. We've had a number of demos of all of the platforms. Partners are able to sit with us in the demo and or view the demo after the fact. We have those recorded and accessible. And then we've done a few pilots um, testing some of these platforms out on a small scale. Some of the pilots require um, a lot of investment to build that out in on the front end. So not everything was feasible to pilot, but we kind of did our best to try to test things out, see if they're working, and then kind of lean towards, um, collect that feedback and lean towards one way or um, another. And so we did this for several months and recently in November and December, we asked our partners, now that you've been through this journey with us, can you let us know kind of what is most important to you? Is there a, is there a platform that really sticks out as a clear, clear winner or, you know, in your mind, something that would really work for the system? And then in January and February, we are hosting leadership meetings to, to loop in the, the key leadership of the core and required partners at the American Job Centers to make sure that we have their buy-in, everyone really understands what this means for their organization, what this means for their staff, what this means for just service delivery across the board, and how this could potentially change the way that they, they do work. Um, and then, you know, overall, like what the working group came to um, came to the conclusion of. And then our hope is by March, we will have a final recommendation to present to um, the Workforce Investment Board and the Service Delivery Committee on that board so that we can get their um, consensus and their approval kind of to move forward um, and start build out an implementation of whatever platform we choose. Go ahead, jump to the next slide. Oh, sorry, this got a little, little wacky, but um, we, had, these are the, the platforms we looked at. So we did um, extensive research on what platforms are out there. We asked areas in Illinois, we asked some areas across the country, what are they using, what seems to work? And so these are the ones that we looked at as a group. So we had Career Connect, that's a local um, platform that's being used for case management for Title I, Illinois WorkNet, sure everyone's um, aware of that. It's kind of run by SIU, contracted by DCO. It has a lot of, um, it has the AJC Service Finder, we owe a policies, professional development opportunities um, in that system, and it's being used by SNAP ENT. NowPow and Unite Us is another platform we looked at. Um, Google Forms, very, very simple you know, just notification. This is a referral that we want you to work on. Um, Illinois Job Link is being um, used by IDES. Um, and we we looked at that as an option. Rise Kit is also kind of a, a local provider that does a little case management, but has referral capabilities. My OneFlow, um, same with that. It's a, a 
for profit for profit company that um, really focuses on the customer experience and the customer journey. Um, Iris is like a social social service uh, network that that is also has referral capabilities. At Work Solutions, I think that that's based out of Indiana, and it, and it's custom build out very like I got um, like a web page almost that you know it's very simple like you know here are the services here's the referrals. And then Atlas, which is um, a system that's used across the country over over 80 American job centers that really has a lot of other tools in there too, but their one-stop operator portal does have a referral piece. Um, do all of them meet PII guidelines? So yeah, a, a lot, like all of them are, will claim that they're under secure networks. Um, and so like that, that was, definitely a question that was asked throughout the the working groups um some of those are a little bit more uh like i think it was now unite us or now pow has is hip no iris is hipaa hipaa level pii and then there's some you know, that have you know security like you know google but it's a little bit on the the lower end so we try not to share um you know super sensitive information from there so that's that was something we we looked at yeah Okay, I wanna to jump to the, the next one. So based on our partners, here are the features that they found uh, most important. They wanna make sure that this referral platform is accessible to all partners. It allows for us to have email um, notifications when you get a referral, when you receive a referral, or when you send a referral. Um, they all need to have reporting functionality or a dashboard and outcome sharing. Um, ideally, you would have some message system that you can use to communicate. Uh, ability to schedule appointments was something that I think we ended up moving to the nice to haves, but it's it was um, originally something that they they wanted. A common intake and release form was was important, and then having the ability to upload files. Some of the other things that we looked at that were nice to have, but not necessarily deal breakers, is that the customer can start the referral process. You'd have the ability to text or, or blast out notifications to customers. Um, we would love to have uh, calendar capabilities so that we can be on the same page um, with events coming up and be able to communicate those events. Same thing with resource newsletter um, and connecting to jobs. So... These are, you know, things are that came from the partners that we um, did an analysis on each of the platforms, like how well do the platforms meet these features, these, this wish list. We also looked at costs, timeline, and is this something we can grow with? Um, under must-haves, just get, yes, yeah, so the, we can, we can add PII as, as one of those must-haves there. Um, and yeah, we do want to scale scale with this platform. Absolutely, Tracy or Kathy. Um, okay, next referral systems. Yeah, so we, we just started to collect surveys from our partners asking them which systems do they recommend? And we got a pretty good um, spread across the whole network. However, we did not get that many submissions. Um, so we didn't have that many people vote on what platform is, is most important to them. We would like to see a, a little bit of a bigger turnout. Okay, I'm gonna jump to the next one. So what is coming up as number one so far in, as we only collected about 12 responses um, is, is Illinois WorkNet. And a lot of what we're hearing is a lot of people really like that because they're already using this as, as a system. And this wouldn't add to the number of platforms that they have to get into every day for their job. So that was um, high on the list. However, I do wanna you know be transparent with the fact that when we started to collect those 12 votes, 12 responses, um, we didn't have what it would cost to maintain that website on an annual basis. So if we were just to contract with Illinois WorkNet directly to build out a referral portal and use that for LWIA 7, the cost would be about comparable to the other um, the other options like Atlas and Workforce Solutions. With, with that in mind, you know, I know that many of 
the the people who did voice their opinion, um, they liked Illinois WorkNet because they thought there was going to be free or or very, very low cost because it's a state system that we're already using. But that is not necessarily the case unless DCEO would alter their existing agreement to include referrals in there. Um, so that is something that I would want to take another look at with the partners and say, like, so if Illinois WorkNet was the same cost year after year, and we would have to potentially do some type of cost sharing to pay for that. Would that um, change change your vote at all? Um, so that's something that I just want to throw out that caveat that that is not um, something we were we really understood when we got started. It was more of an assumption that it would be much much lower cost and or free on an annual basis after we do the initial build out. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Um, coming in second place was Atlas and Workforce Solutions. But again, I feel like this is a uh, a small, It's a, we did not get many responses. Yeah, so I wanna go to the next slide here. So this is just gives you some idea of um, everyone's top, you know, their first choice, second choice, third choice, and, and those that would not recommend across the board. Were the systems comparable in cost from what you saw and what you knew? Yeah, the, the ones that made the top three were, um, whether it's a little bit heavier on the initial build out or a little bit heavier on the end, um, Atlas and, and Illinois WorkNet were very similar in cost. Um, At Work Solutions was actually very, very, um, it was less expensive, <laughs> surprisingly. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think we, I don't know if we have a slide that has those numbers, but we do have it um, in in our full deck, which we want to, you know, invite everyone to look at. Um, and then if, if you are available, we have these leadership meetings where everyone is, is welcome to sit in and really we're going to go in depth into the analysis of each platform, um, and, and what the, the results are showing. I can go to the, the next slide so we can show kind of what the partners feel are most important. And again, this is only out of our 12 respondents. Um, the fact that it has all of the wish list features was, was number one on the list, um, being able to easily navigate and it being very user-friendly or having it available on mobile was the second one. The cost was coming in on the third one, even though um, when we were listening in the work group and, and talking amongst ourselves, that did come up quite a bit, um, especially coming from some of the, the state agencies kind of, you know, wanting to be very conservative with uh, making sure that we're not committing to, you know, a $10,000 annual um, amount that they would have to to, to pay a portion of every year. And then integration with other systems, all the additional features that would be really nice to grow with. Um, and then the time frame, as you as you can imagine, is um, towards the end since we have been operating with that one for, for quite some time. Okay, I'm gonna jump to the next slide, I'm not sure. So this gives a little bit more of an overview. Um, as to what each of the top three systems pros and cons are. I think, um, I don't know if there's anything I wanna call out specifically. Does WorkNet have the, the texting capability? It does not. Okay. Oh, is that must be one of the nice to haves then, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's one of the nice to haves. But it does have an existing API agreement in place to share some information with um, another one of our titles, which Atlas and Workforce Solutions, we would be starting from, from scratch there. Yeah, Stacey. Oh. Yeah, Tara, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that was one of the appealing things that most people were talking about with Illinois WorkNet, being able to share data um, with, you know, IDHS or some of the state organizations. So, yeah, might be easier through Illinois WorkNet. Yes. And the fact that they are somewhat already familiar with that system came up um, a lot. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, I think that there's one more slide that just continues on with pros and cons. Yeah, so we would have to, to build out that Illinois WorkNet system, even though um, there are some people in the state with the SNAP ENT program who are already using that as a referral, that, using that referral piece in Illinois WorkNet. Um, yeah, Carrie, do you want to say anything? Two questions. The first one is just sort of technical about the survey. Um, so you said you had 12 responses so far, is that correct? I think so. Um, yeah. And, and um, a couple of times you've mentioned people wanting to use a system they're familiar with or don't have to duplicate to another system. So do you know the respondents, those 12 respondents by which title they work in? We, we can, we definitely can look at that on the back end. Yes. Um, I think that would be interesting as you, if you get more, <clears throat> just to see if there's a difference. Um, and then my second question is more like sustainability sort of higher level. So is the idea that you'll pick a referral system and then it will become like the mandatory system that every partner in that AJC has to use. And it'll be like, that will be, um, I don't know, like all written out, like that'll be part of the MOU agreement and like both the, the use of it and all the policies around using it and when to use it and information sharing and all of that would be part of that MOU process and then and cost sharing if that was that is that correct that that is the hope um, so the partnership did um, commit to paying for the build out of whatever, whatever program we initially choose and then building in the maintenance of that with the OSO as the lead to make sure that the proper training is being used, um, that the proper training is being given and that the system is being used by the monthly partner meetings that we have and, and constantly, you know, bringing this up as, as the tool that all the partners um, in LWEA 7 are committed to. Okay, thanks. And, and so then, oh yeah, thanks, that's fine. Thanks, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, so this is what we've been doing for the past year, trying to narrow it down to what platforms make sense, what what is what do the partners want? And then um, now we're at the point to bring in um, everyone who was not in that in those working group meetings, all the all the leaders that we really need for them to to, to get on board um, you know, with us in this in this build out and implementation of an actual referral platform, finally. Yes, Janice. Yes. Hi, right. when can we um, expect the invitations for that leadership meeting? Yeah. So I believe those um, went out um, early in this year. And if you haven't got one, we can forward them out. We have four meetings coming up, two remaining in January and then two in February. So there's still time um, to look over the materials. We even give recordings of the demo if that's something that you're interested in and then um, attend those leadership meetings so that we can really talk about what this what this means and kind of having um, some asks to have you with us on this journey. Oh, hold on. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing. This is really cool. I'm I'm eager to see how this goes and where it goes because this could be a, a game changer. Just, are there any any thoughts about you know Illinois WorkNet as a platform since that seems to be the the lead contender at the moment? Hi, um, this is. Sorry, Amy. No, I just had one question about scalability. So a lot of this has been done for Elwia 7. Are there questions on the survey or is there an opportunity to discuss scalability? Like for WorkNet, would that be um, for the whole state or would that just be for Elwia 7? I mean, we would want the whole state to be. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would love that too. If we, we can get everyone across on one platform. Um, when, when we sent out emails for the leadership committee, we got um, 
a request from Julio to to see if if he to meet with us and and talk about that. So um, that was really really exciting. I, I can speak a little bit about the Illinois WorkNet. <laughs> so yeah. this is Natasha with Illinois WorkNet. <clears throat> we do have excuse me <clears throat> having troubles with my voice all day. <laughs> we have. <clears throat> We use the referral piece already with our SNAP ENT uh, partners, and we've used it in past projects. Um, so we, we do have it in place for certain programs based on the business requirements for that program. But it's something that, you know, once we have in place and have business requirements for, we could easily do it across the state. We're already doing it, but it's, you know, very specific for various programs. We would have to do a full new build out for um, the AJC partners for referrals. Well, it's you, yes, and it, I mean, <laughs> it's really not a full new build out. It's taking our existing tools and putting it in a space that it would be used by those specific partners and managed by those partners. But it would take developer time to set up that space. <clears throat> Thanks, Natasha. Laura, did you have your hand up and then you took it down? I just want to make sure you have time if you had something you wanted to mention. I did have it up and I took it down because Natasha responded. I just, I, I had, I was aware that they were also using the referral section under the JTED program, which is a state um, workforce program. Um, so I do know that they have um, developed that for the JTED program as well. So, um, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so we have it developed out so that <clears throat> we have like within the D, the SNAP program, it's more of like both partners are both in the system. So it's, you know, internal back and forth uh, between those partners. For the JTED program, we expanded it out so that they can send referrals. Like, for example, a JTED grantee would be in the system and they can send out a referral in a secure way to a partner that does not require them to log into Illinois WorkNet. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Natasha, for joining. Um, I think that referrals are an important part of the service integration and that um, but Sarah and Andrew keep reminding me that the policy recommendations don't have to be super specific. And in fact, we probably wouldn't want to rewrite the policy to be as specific to Illinois WorkNet um, because in the focus groups, we heard from some LWIAs that, you know, a couple of them feel like they have a really solid thing in place with referrals. And so I think, you know, we probably just want to make it as a recommendation that there is something in place because we know that a lot of LBS don't have necessarily anything in place for referrals. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Um, as as another piece to be thinking as far as forward thinking, moving beyond the referral, some of the conversations happening at the state level are talking about referral outcomes. So more than referring a client to another title or service, it has to there to be thinking forward um, of being able to track that co-enrollment in titles, co-enrollment in services. Was that service picked up? Did that student client receive services from that other title that it was referred to? So as you're looking at the referrals, also um, to, to be aware that the conversations at the state level are also looking at um, referral outcomes and thinking about how that is tracked in these processes as well. Um, because we're moving beyond the time when we can just say, I referred a student from Title II to Title I um, and not being able to know if that student got that um, service picked up. So some of that tracking is going to become part of where, where we could be moving. And I don't want to speak for all the titles. I'm simply saying that these are conversations that are happening at the state level and to be aware as you move forward with these work group discussions um, on referrals to be thinking about how are you going to track the referral outcomes. 
And do these systems allow for that? Because that is definitely um, a conversation that's happening. So the, the referral outcomes piece was a must to have feature and all the platforms meet that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just, you know, like I said, as you lay this out, that is one of the things to make sure we, we need to be able to um, integrate in a meaningful way. And, and also in those outcomes, I don't know what these systems have, um, but also thinking about if a, a person was, for my lack of a better word, denied um, a referral. Um, I have a student, I send a student over to another title and the other title says, no, we're not going to support this student. And here's the why. And there's a rational reason and a logical reason, but that needs to be documented as to why an individual was, um, for my lack of a better word in this conversation, denied services. Um, that needs to be part of it as well. Yes. Okay, I'm wanting to be sure that we end on time here. And so the next um, point is around a policy writing subgroup invitation. Sarah, I don't know if you want to say- Are we ready to write policy? Because I, I don't know that we're ready for that step. Are we? What do you, what would you like to do? I mean, this is just asking a subgroup to come together. I think that's how some of the other working groups have done. Oh, know? I just, I didn't realize we were at a point where we were ready to start putting policy um, on paper. I, I didn't think we we're at that point yet, but it sounds like the members of this committee feel like we're at a point that we can start writing policy. Mm -hmm. Um, what do other committee members think? I guess I had the same reaction as Kathy. I mean, maybe I'm just not hearing conclusive things that we've yeah. done. So. Right. And I would say I have to kind of agree. Uh, if you're wanting a policy writing subgroup, what are the tasks that you're going to give to that subgroup? What, what places in the policy do you feel that they should tackle and, and with what information um, have that we have gathered during these preliminary meetings so are we going to use as a, a means to, to do that? Well, we have three areas of the policy that we're focused on and the other areas are being um, addressed in other work groups. And we are still um, pulling out the themes from the focus groups and also looking at the local plans. Um, so I, you know, maybe this was too soon to put the invitation out and we can report out in February in more detail about the plans and about the work groups. And um, we can ask for sub, you know, for the policy writing subgroup, uh, we can do that next time. So I apologize yes, okay. uh, to clarify. I just read in the chat that the PowerPoint from the meeting with the focus group results will be shared after the meeting. So as I'm looking at this, what I what I interpreted, and again, just for clarity, that we had the focus groups and then you had the representation from Title I and Title III to some points made earlier. It does not appear from these conversations that we had full participation from all the partners. So, um, okay. Okay, I see what she's saying now. This PowerPoint. Okay, Do we, will this say, committee have the results from the focus groups that you've conducted or is that something you're still working on then? Yeah, we have we have the notes. We can okay. share out the notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there a step that we can take? And I'm more than happy to do the work if you if you want me to do this, to bring in the other titles, to give them a voice at the table. I'll be more than happy to step up and do the work. Um, but I do think that we can't get to a point of policy writing until everyone's at the table. 
So if you, I'm again, more than happy to step in. If you give me the guidance and the questions and the direction you want that to go, I'll be more than happy to step in and do that work um, or assist somebody with that if they would choose to do so. But I don't know that we can get to a point of actually writing policy without all the title voices at the table. Recognizing that that's what you were going for when you started, I know, I know that's what we're looking at, but how, I, how can I assist you with this? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of Title II um, individuals on the invitation. We can go back and look at who the invitation went out to and if and figure out like how we could set up another time to have a focus group with them, you know, how that you know, I, I we did hear back from and one. we can work offline if you want me to if you want me to do this. I'll be more than happy to follow your lead on this offline so we don't have to drag everyone in that conversation. But I'm more than happy if I'm gonna ask you to make sure we have those voices at the table, then I will absolutely step up and do the work to make sure we have those voices there. So if you just tell me what you need me to do, I'll do it. Okay. That sounds great. Okay. So we'll come back with more detail in at February's meeting and move on from there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.